Welcome. I'm Reverend Jenny Smith. And I'm Reverend Ian Collier. Together, we serve as the pastors here at Wesley Freedom United Methodist Church. And we're so grateful that all of you who are tuning in have joined us today for this time of worship. We pray that these encounters are helping you connect with God and with community. This summer, we've been sharing encounters with Jesus in which we have been reminded of the love and the grace of God, which helps us to grow and helps us to overcome life's challenges. Today, we consider the harvest, the abundance that God hopes to share with us in our lives, and the harvest that God invites us to share with the lives of those in our community. To, as you worship today, we invite you to consider your blessings and to consider your gifts and the abundance God has given. Consider how you can uniquely partner with God in extending God's blessing to others. This service is really an invitation for you to discern how you can utilize who you are and what God has given you in order to live out your purpose and bless the lives of others. May God bless you and challenge you today as we worship. is called 
invite you into a moment of prayer. Almighty God, this season is challenging, and we have experienced many losses. Still, God, as we worship this day, we are a grateful people. We give you thanks for our lives, each a precious gift from you. We give you thanks for breath and the ways your spirit fills us and carries us through each moment. We give you thanks for the health with which we rise this day and every ounce of strength you have offered. We thank you, God, for the abundance of food in our land and fresh water to drink. We give thanks for the homes you have provided to keep us safe. We give you thanks for family. Though spread out, we give you thanks for visits and calls in the presence of those who love us. We give you thanks for the freedom available in our nation and for all who work to make ours a more just union. We give you thanks, God, for the ways you have planted faith in us, for the ways you have extended yourself, inviting us into relationship with you. And we give you thanks, God, for the strength, the love, the peace, and the hope that we find in you alone. God, you are a God of abundance, and we are a grateful people. We pray for all who are hungry or thirsty, for those seeking employment, for those who search for safe homes. God, provide for your people and give us the clarity to understand when we are those through whom your provision might be realized. God, as we find ourselves in abundance, teach us to use our intellect, our education, our resources, our energy, our very breath towards serving our neighbors and building your good kingdom on earth. As we find ourselves blessed, God, to know you as Savior and Lord, inspire us to give ourselves to the work of sharing your grace with those you put before us. These are complicated times, Lord. Help us not to shut down, being overwhelmed by the complexity of it all. But God, help us to find the one way, the honest way, the meaningful way, to give some of what you have given to bless another. Through Jesus Christ, we pray this and the prayer which you have taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, that we would forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, friends. Here in Carroll County, or especially in the greater downtown Eldersburg area, it's kind of a harvest time. If you were lucky enough to plant some fruits and vegetables in the spring, they're coming on plentiful now. So the cool thing is we all have some really great things to eat, but they also take a lot of care. And if you um, neglect them and you don't get out there and pick them, things can happen that make them not very good to eat. They can split and crack. They can start to go bad. And nobody wants to eat those. And they go to waste. In today's scripture, which is found in Matthew 9, verses 35 to 38, Jesus is talking about the harvest. And I think it's really cool if you start at the beginning um, where the story is set in motion where Jesus and his disciples are traveling from town to town and city to city, and he is teaching in the synagogues, and he's telling them all about the kingdom of God. And while he's there, the people in the crowds are coming forward, and he's healing their illnesses and their sicknesses and their disease, but he's also healing their bruised spirits and their hurting lives. And for us today, we probably all know people that are lonely, people that are feeling isolated, people that are sick, maybe even people that are hungry. 
And Jesus turns to the disciples after he has looked at the crowd and he says, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Because when he looked at that crowd, his heart was broken. He just felt so sad that there were so many people who were lost and sad and broken, and they just didn't know what to do or who to turn to. He provided them some comfort, but he knew that he needed more people to do the same. And he asked us to pray to the God of the harvest and ask for more workers. So what he put in motion is that you and I are a part of that big plan that we can show his love to all of our friends, neighbors, and even people that we don't know through our words and through our actions. So if you think about someone who maybe is lonely, you can think about a way to reach out to them. If you think about somebody who's hungry, you can think of a way to help that person. Or if you know someone who's sick and they just need someone to listen to them and provide them comfort, you can be that person. And it doesn't matter how big you are or how little you are, you can share God's love with them. And while you're there, you can share the remarkable story of the life of Jesus. So we have a big responsibility to get out there and to help with God's harvest, to reach out and talk to people and share God's love with them. Please share this prayer with me. Dear God, thank you for letting us be part of your plan. Please show us the ways to love one another through words and actions. Help us to share the good news of Jesus. Thank you for your love. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. My name is Susan Steiner, and this morning I will be reading the scripture from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 28 to 41. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father, they said? The first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Hear these words from the beginning of Matthew's gospel. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were troubled and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, 
The size of the harvest is bigger than you can imagine, but there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers for his harvest. The harvest has already begun. Are you ready to get to work? Now, this probably sounds as counterintuitive to us as we sit here in the heat of summer, looking at fields and most of our lawns that just have grass in them, uh, as it did to the disciples who were looking out at this crowd of struggling people. They knew nothing of the kingdom of God. They were not producing fruit. How could Jesus talk of a harvest? Surely, surely Jesus did not mean to imply that the disciples should begin to reap the produce of a Christian life from a people who didn't even know about God's kingdom, right? That would make no sense. We all know the effort and steps that you need in order to get a successful harvest. First, it's clear, when you get a new field, you need to prepare the soil. You need to figure out how to grow things in that ground. You need to learn your context, what the language of the people is, what appeals to them, how they prefer to be communicated to. Maybe what Jesus really meant was that the harvest might be large if only we had more staff to till the ground. Then, obviously, Jesus was forgetting that someone needed to plant the seeds. How could the disciples reap what nobody had sown? How could anybody come to God if the church isn't the one to put God into their hearts and their minds? Maybe Jesus really meant that the harvest might be large if only we had more planters. Finally, we know that in order for a farm to be fruitful, the crops have to be tended to, fertilized, watered, pruned, encouraged. The disciples needed to start these crowds off first with some bite-sized discipleship opportunities, then plug them in and get them more involved before they were ready for a harvest, maybe a small group. Yeah, that would make them produce fruit. So maybe Jesus really meant that the harvest might be large if only we could get those heathens on the street more involved. Of course, maybe, just maybe, Jesus meant what he said. The crowds of people who had been neglected by their religious leaders, ignorant of the kingdom of God, troubled and helpless in the face of the world, these are the people who are ready to be reaped, to be brought into God's house. The idea of reaping doesn't have a particularly positive connotation for us. Uh, our minds usually jump to that final reaping of our souls as we join our departed brothers and sisters. It's no surprise that whenever we picture an old-time harvester with that scythe in hand, it doesn't take much for our minds to jump to placing him in tattered black robes and then all of a sudden, a harvester is a grim reaper. It's this image that I think leads us to assume that the harvest happens when we're fully matured in faith. It happens after we've spent our entire life growing and producing fruit, and finally at the last, God grants us rest. We are harvested, and we join the church triumphant. The slash of death's scythe cuts us off from life, and it's something we fear. But Jesus changes up this narrative. You see, right after this passage is when Christ sends out his disciples to the Jews to proclaim the kingdom of heaven. What we normally see and what we normally think about as the scattering of seed, Christ presents here as the harvest. I want us to sit with this change in perspective today, because I think if we plumb the depths of what Christ has spoken, it might open up for us a whole new world of living this fall. So let's assume that the crowds 
who know nothing of Jesus except that he does miracles, are really ready for a harvest. What does this imply? Well, what would you see in your mind if you were to witness a field full of ripe corn that's harvest ready? Probably you would imagine that someone has already worked the soil. You would imagine that seeds were planted with care, that someone had taken the time to nurture and water the crops. So much work must have already gone into the field before it was ready for the harvest. And I think that even though these crowds were not yet told anything about the coming of the kingdom of God, that had already happened. See, these words of Jesus reflect this Christian doctrine of prevenient grace. Prevenient is an obscure word, but all it means is going before. Before the disciples had ever laid eyes on this crowd of people, God had been among them, working within them. As Methodists, we believe that no person, no creation of God, is ever without God's grace. God's grace is what gives us life. God's grace is what gives us nurture and growth. God's grace gives us our very conscience. God's mercy is over all God's works. So even before we get on the scene, even before we meet any person, God has been at work in that person's life. And God is always at work in our life before we ask for it and before we are aware of it. It was God who tilled the soil and prepared the crowds to hear. It was God who planted the seeds of faith within them and tended to them. It was God who worked the field even if the crowds did not have the words to recognize that it was God who they had experienced. When Jesus saw this pitiful multitude of persons before him, neglected, troubled, oppressed, he saw those in whom God had already been at work. Troubled, not abandoned. Ignorant, not lost. Sheep without a shepherd, but one word away from flourishing. You see, it's not that Christ had the disciples go out among the people in order to bring God to the people. The disciples went to labor among the people because Christ discerned that God was already there. Discipleship in this way means finding where God is already active and joining in God's mission in progress. I've heard a lot of anxiety, especially from parents, about this fall. How to manage work and education and life. Not just parents, of course. Everyone's anxious over the ways COVID will affect the economy, what their businesses and livelihoods will look like if there's another shutdown, what it means to constantly have to be on edge. We're anxious because we like to plant our own fields. We like to prepare our own crops. We have a picture of success in our minds and we labor towards that success. We tell ourselves that we'll work our own land and raise our own crops and that it will belong to us and be our glory. We'll make ourselves be just as productive, doing everything we always have and be a brilliant teacher's aide, and put on that addition to the house. And by all our own effort, we'll be able to do it if we just believe in ourselves, and no matter what, we will deserve what we have worked for. We'll put in the work and reap our rewards. Our life is our farm, and it will be productive because we planted it, we tended it, and no matter what's going on around us, we'll make the crops that we want to grow, grow. Or at least that's what we tell ourselves to push back against our anxiety. But listen closely now. 
as we heard in the scripture that was read before this sermon, we're reminded that our place in this story is not as the owner of the farm. It's not our job to plan out where God's kingdom will grow or presume to give growth to God's life in our world. As Jesus says in the parable of the tenants, God, the owner of the vineyard, he's already planted the seeds. He's built his towers. He's put a fence around. And whatever is going to be full of abundant life in this world, and especially this world now, is not going to be created by our efforts. Our job as the harvesters, as the tenant farmers, is to look and see where God is already at work and join him in his efforts. Just as Christ saw a crowd of people in whom God had already been at work before the disciples even existed and told them to go and harvest. In this season, we have had our own planting programs squashed before our eyes. So we must look to see where God is creating life now and follow God's lead. You see, we lie to ourselves when we talk of our personal property or our personal hopes and dreams because we're not owners, we're tenants. We work in a world not our own, it, with matter itself that was created by someone else. All is God's. And when we think that we are entitled to something in this world just because we work for it, or earned it with hard work, we're swiftly reminded that our stuff, our bodies, our very existence is on loan. It's a gift from God, and we are guest workers in God's vineyard. Now, this sounds harsh, but it's actually good news. See, for all this anxiety, we are reminded that it's not our job to create the vineyard. If we're pretending like we own the land and are in control, that's actually sinful. It's not our job to force success. It's not our job to try and plan a fall season where everything can be managed according to our ideas or what's happened in years past. We get to let that go. We're tenant farmers. We are called to discern where God is already working, where God has done some planting for us now, and to participate in the harvest that God has prepared for us. So if you're worried that you can't handle everything this fall, you're probably trying to plant your own farm rather than tend what God has planted for you at this time. God has planted enough for you and enough for the kingdom if you harvest where God has planted and not where you have been reaping in years past. Look for what God is doing in the world now. See where the harvest of God has come now and let go of those places where God is not calling you to harvest. Beloved, in this message of freedom, Christ also gives a warning. If we do not take up our job as the farmhand of God and instead try to commandeer God's farm, if we say, we put in all this labor, how could this not belong to us to do with as we please? If we use the resources that we've been entrusted with according to our own plan or try to replant God's vineyard, then bad things happen. What should be the fruits of the Spirit sour into the grapes of wrath. And on the last day, in the words of the great battle hymn, the Lord tramples down the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored as he looses the fateful lightning from his terrible swift sword. If we pretend the plan is our own, that our property is our own, that our lives are our own, then what God calls for the harvest 
at that time, we'll be so habituated into grasping tightly to our plan and to our crops that we'll find ourselves responding to God that he can reap our fruit over our dead bodies. And so it's no wonder why the only reaper in our lives would be grim. But if we labor under that lie, that lie that we own the world, own our lives, own our very selves, we turn to injustice in our actions. Our debt to God would be unpaid. But in Christ, in Christ we are shown another way. We're promised not a reaping of death, but one of life. We're invited to let go of the grim reaping of our imagination and choose to live as laborers in God's vineyard. This fall, don't try to manipulate your life to go according to your plan. It's not going to happen. Rather, see where God has already planted. Look for where God is at work now. Discern God's prevenient grace and get to work there. Be a reaper. Tend the harvest. The reaping of those who try to keep the fruits of God's world for themselves is death. But for any who respond to the grace of God, it's the beginning of eternal life. So let go of your need to be the boss of your life. You're not self-sufficient, and you're not independent. Let yourself be a tenant farmer in whatever vineyard God has already planted for us today. And as you see where God's grace already is, then you can raise your scythe high, proclaim the good news of Christ Jesus, and remember that you are only responsible for harvesting what God has planted now. Find it and be at peace. Amen. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow.
love how you serve i'll serve if this life i lose i will follow where you go i'll go Pastor Ian shared this morning, the harvest is abundant, and it can feel like the laborers are few. Our worship today does not end when you click off your device. We hope that you will take the next step in serving God through community. If you live here near us in Eldersburg, we invite you to serve through the ministries of Wesley Freedom United Methodist Church. You can go now to our website, click the Connect and Serve button, and find a smorgasbord of ways that you can use your gifts, your energy, your time. Whether you're staying home to stay safe or you're willing to serve outside or in community, we have a meaningful place for you to connect and serve. We also invite you to consider, if you live nearby, if you have not become a member of Wesley Freedom Church, this might be your season. We have a Next Step new members class beginning this September. You'll find that information in all of our fall adult, youth, and children's ministries and small groups found on our website. If you don't live close to us, maybe you're worshiping from farther away, somewhere else in the country or the state, we know that you can find meaningful ways to serve in your community. Just reach out to a church or a pastor or a community service organization near you and find some ways to meaningfully live out your call. The harvest is abundant and your life will be blessed as you continue to serve in unique and creative ways. As always, we'd like to thank you for continuously being a generous people. This summer, your offerings have allowed us to connect with over a hundred teenagers as we continue our youth programs. During one of the most disconnected moments of their lives, we are able to provide online and in-person ministry, which has helped many stay connected to Christ and to their community. As we move towards the fall, your gifts are empowering us to continually expand our ministries, to offer online and in-person ministries to children, youth, and adults. We especially are excited to begin offering an eight-week Sunday school outside with social distancing to help our children who aren't able to interact and find community currently in their school buildings to find a place for meaningful relationship. Thank you so much for your giving, and we hope that you will find a way to connect and to benefit from the growth that is happening here at Wesley Freedom. We invite you to go now in peace. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, go forth to serve. Amen. <laughs>